Hello and welcome to the Monday, November 6, 2023 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. The Zero Day Initiative on Friday released uh, details regarding four vulnerabilities in Exchange Server that so far, according to the Zero Day Initiative, have not been patched. Now, there is a little bit of controversy here as to, first of all, how severe these vulnerabilities are and whether or not they are exploitable in a current uh, issues of uh, the exchange server. The first one that is labeled here as CDI 2315.78. It's a remote code execution flaw and it allows the execution of arbitrary code as system. Now, Microsoft stated in a response here that customers who have applied the August security update are already protected. So in that way, it would no longer be exploitable. The remaining three vulnerabilities are all very similar. They're essentially URI validation vulnerabilities where an attacker is able to uh, trick the system into, for example, downloading data from a URI that, well, uh, the attacker isn't supposed to be able to download data from. At least sort of that's a description from a CDI. Microsoft's response, on the other hand, states that uh, these vulnerabilities do not really present a uh, privilege escalation. They just execute uh, functionality as the user logged in. So it's not that you would be able to download data from another user or escalate privileges, basically doing things that you weren't supposed to be doing. And yes, you do need credentials. Uh, so in so far, these are really, according to Microsoft, non-issues, which is why they haven't fixed them yet. The Zero Day Initiative, uh, which is Trend Micro, has uh, notified Microsoft of these vulnerabilities beginning of September. So now their waiting period basically expired where they made the existence of these vulnerabilities public. I'll link uh, to an article by Bleeping Computer that pretty well summarizes sort of what the uh, Trend Micro and Zero Day Initiative said and also how Microsoft responded. Personally, here I tend uh, to believe uh, Microsoft in their assessment of uh, these vulnerabilities. In general, it has been an ongoing issue that a user with credentials uh, has been able to escalate privileges or essentially do things that they were not supposed to do. That's probably one of the most important things that you have to sort of cover if you're running exchange, if you have applied your patches, that you have to somehow control who's logging in, where they're logging in from, and they look essentially for anomalies here when it comes to login activity. Then I have a story that uh, I don't think I covered yet, even though I probably should have, but uh, sort of didn't quite make the cut in prior uh, issues of the podcast. About a week ago, Kaspersky came forward with what they're calling Striped Fly. It's a more sophisticated uh, exploit chain that, well, uh, masquerades, uh, masquerades as a cryptocurrency miner. And uh, that's, I think, the real interesting part here. We do see so many cryptocurrency miners. And of course, off the reaction is, well, yet another cryptocurrency miner. Let's delete it, move on. No real need to further analyze it. Well, uh, this particular cryptocurrency miner really appears to be more sort of a decoy where below the sort of obvious activity, it also uses the eternal blue exploit uh, to then spread locally. Kaspersky does associate this activity with the Equation Group, which of course is their name for essentially NSA, US government. Eternal Blue has of course been out there uh, for a while and has been used by all kinds of groups. I'll leave it up to you whether or not you want to attribute that or not. Uh, they do provide some other evidence here. But I think the main lesson here is if you see a cryptocurrency miner, my number one reaction usually is you must have an easy to exploit vulnerability net system. So it would be actually unusual if the only thing you have on that system is a cryptocurrency miner. You probably have other things going on as well, whether they are part of the cryptocurrency miner or whether that's distinct separate malware well uh, that may differ from case to case 
And then there's a story I do want to cover because I've seen a lot of publicity around it, but I do also want to prefix this that I think uh, the story itself uh, was a bit overhyped, and that's the use of Apple's Find My Network in order to exfiltrate data. The issue behind all of this is that Apple's Find My Network basically turns all iOS uh, devices, think macOS devices as well, into receivers that listen for find by my messages being a broadcast uh, by devices in their vicinity and Apple AirTags and such, of course, and then relay them to the Apple uh, iCloud. And from there, the owner of a particular device could review the location. But of course, location information, well, is just numbers. So that means that more or less any data can be encoded in these messages. You just have to be able to inject these messages into the Find My Network. That's also really not that terribly difficult because the keys being used to digitally sign these messages are in the actual device. So that's a device that a consumer would own and would potentially be able to get access to the keys too. So really not such a big deal. It's just yet another exfiltration technique. You can probably do the same thing via dozens of other methods as well. Maybe the only sort of difference here is a little bit that sort of innocent bystander that sort of acts as a relay in uh, this particular uh, setup. But if you can get an innocent bystander in the vicinity with an active iOS device, then probably you could just basically go there yourself uh, with an iOS device uh, to receive any messages. Well, this is it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.